Hello, and a warm welcome to this special extended season of The Hive Podcast, featuring the interviews from my new book, Business Unusual, Values, Uncertainty, and the Psychology of Brand Resilience. Join me, Natalie Nahai, as I dive into the conversations behind the quotes and hear from the world's leading experts, psychologists, and business leaders, whose insights and ideas are transforming how we work, rest, and play. I'll be releasing a new episode here each week, but if you'd like to download everything at once and access additional resources and recommended reading, I've made all of this available to readers over at businessunusualthebook.com. And if you're tempted to discover more about your motivations and the principles that drive you, you can check out thevaluesmap.com, a platform I've designed in collaboration with Dr. Kiki Leutner of Goldsmiths University to help you identify, develop, and communicate the psychological values you and your organization represent. This series and the book and the values map have been over a year in the making, and I'm really excited to share it all with you. Thanks for joining me on this journey, and I hope you enjoy the show. In today's conversation, I speak with Amy C. Edmondson, the Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management at Harvard Business School, whose most recent book, The Fearless Organization, examines the powerful role of psychological safety in teamwork and innovation. Based upon almost 30 years of research, Amy's work explores what it takes for groups of people to perform at a high level and the dynamic forms of collaboration that are needed in environments characterized by uncertainty and ambiguity. Before her academic career, Amy was Director of Research at Pecos River Learning Centers, where she worked with founder and CEO Larry Wilson to design change programs in large companies. In the early 1980s, she worked as Chief Engineer for architect inventor Buckminster Fuller, and innovation in the built environment remains an area of enduring interest and passion. Amy, thank you so much for your time and speaking with me today for this special episode of the podcast. My pleasure. So I'd like to start with a very, very open question, which I invite all of my guests to engage in. And that is, from your perspective, what you think is happening in the global human psyche right now, if we use that frame. Wow, that is a big question. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think we are on the verge of an awakening to new possibilities. And it's easy to feel right now that what's happening in the global human psyche is a period of great um, concern and anxiety, I guess, about the future Mm. and so many aspects of the future, the environment, our health, our economies, Mm. on and on it goes. And I think there hasn't really been a better time to talk about the area of research which you have dedicated much of your professional life to exploring, so this concept of psychological safety, because without this, it's very hard to innovate oneself out of a lot of the crises that we now face. So I'd like to start by maybe starting with a definition that you give in your fantastic book, The Fearless Organisation, and you describe the phenomenon as a belief that we won't be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns and mistakes. And I'd like to start really by asking you if, since the publication of your book, you've seen more of an appetite and willingness in organizations to assess and foster psychological safety within their cultures. Yes, I have. In fact, I've been astonished by that appetite as, as I, um, you know, as, as the book has gotten out and I think many online articles that, that others and I have written People are, are taking notice, and that may be a combination of the ordinary recognition of the volatile, uncertain, complex world in which we live and the new intensified recognition of uncertainty and the need for new ideas and innovation and new responses in the, in the face of even greater uncertainty because of the pandemic. And, and so I've been amazed by how much appetite there is to take stock, to look at one's organization's culture and 
say, is this a place where people can speak up, can bring their full selves, their ingenuity, you know, can, can they collaborate with each other without fear of reprisal? And the big push in the U.S., but I think around the world, um, increasingly this past year on diversity and inclusion and belonging has also led to more interest. Mm. Actually, let's pick that thread then, because the inclusion and belonging that you speak about in your book, you talk about them as characteristics of a psychologically safe workplace. What are some of the goals that we might put into place to create such an organisation? Or maybe if that's too daunting a question, the teams that we're working within? It takes deliberate effort, I think, to create a climate of candour. Right? That's probably the simplest, straightest way to say it. Because the natural instinct for human beings is to hold back, is to wait and see, it's to read the tea leaves and you know, figure out what will make me look good in the eyes of my peers or, or managers and what might not be welcome around here. So we're so good at doing that, that we do it without thinking, right? we, we do it spontaneously. And so if you want to change that pattern, you have to override natural instincts. Hmm. And if you want to override natural instincts, I think it has to be done with effort and deliberate intent. And to me, it starts with just being explicit and clear about why. You know, if I don't appreciate why my voice might be welcomed by others, then the easiest thing to do, the safest thing to do is to hold back. But if I'm getting message after message after message that says, we need you, we're dependent on you, you might see something that I miss, your ideas have been great in the past, mm. your perspective on what customers want is unique. If I'm hearing those kind of messages all the time, it helps me take it seriously. Mm. So it's almost like an unlearning of our natural instincts right. and an intentional laying down of new patterns. Right. And then you have to, you know, the the response, let's say, you know, in a sense, that's setting the groundwork. But if if then people say, OK, well, it sounds good. They speak <laughs> up and they get beaten down. You're going to inhibit that future response pretty quickly. So how we respond to each other, of course, matters. Mm. And actually, one of the ways in which we're having to look at that problem is, of course, through the, um, the lens of technology and of remote working, because most of us now and for at least, I would imagine, probably the rest of this year, we're going to have to work together remotely. Mm -hmm. and you point out in the book that much of what we value, even before the pandemic in our modern economies, are actually the result of interdependent actions and decision making, which rely on effective teamwork and dynamic collaboration, which is something you've, you've written a lot about, this idea of, of teaming. And so given that so many of us have to find a way to collaborate and work remotely, what would you suggest are some of the ways in which we can boost organisational resilience, given that a lot of the stuff that we're doing is when, you know, we're not in physical presence with each other and we're having to read maybe an, an impoverished set of cues to be able to get that same psychological safety? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really well put question. You know, the impoverished set of cues captures it um, quite powerfully. And whenever, so that means there's a deficit. There's a deficit of cues that we have to overcome. And much as I think this is too simple an answer, I think it may matter, is that we have to then work even harder at inviting, at clarifying, at connecting. I've been very struck during this period about how the loss of those little bits of time when you are, arrive at a meeting and you know you're in the room and people are coming at ever so slightly different times and you're sort of connecting and and um, saying you know how was your weekend and you just there's a very uh, real human connection that then lasts through mm. the meeting and, and into the future. And without those kinds of spontaneous um, human interactions, you have to, you have to compensate for them in some way. Mm. The virtual meetings tend to start, you know, right on time and we're all there <laughs> suddenly, and then we're all gone suddenly. And it's, it's, you know, it's rather, rather unnatural. So, but just building in um, a little bit of care and concern to 
um, give people opportunities to talk about what they're seeing, what they're thinking, what they're worrying about, um, what's on their plate. Um, and not, not to take excessive time with this, but just to be, to be clear, to connect, to hear people's voices so that they, they feel included. They feel, and I don't mean this in a, in a top down way, but just even, even as peers, we've, you've got to invite people in mm. thoughtfully. Mm. And I wonder if part of that is is feeling like you're actually arriving in contact with the other person. Like one of the things that I've seen as a theme that's come up when speaking with therapists talking about this is the lack of physical moving through space in order to get to somewhere. There's no, you oh. know, when we're <laughs> yeah, when we're sitting at our desks and we have this this sense of functional equivalence between a meeting with a therapist in a room versus on a screen, actually they're very different. Very different. Different yeah. experiences. We don't have the ritual of moving through a threshold like you mentioned in these moments of spontaneity. Right. And I th I don't, you know, this isn't my expertise, but I think the lack of different physical spaces impacts our ability to retain what we're hearing and what we're doing because mm. I think that's very tied up in oh yeah I remember we had that idea and we were sitting at that table <laughs> over lunch oh remember that yeah. right and it's it's all it comes back to you because the whole thing you remember what the other person was was wearing or what you were eating mm. or something like that and 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 with with this new blurs day world that we live in and sitting in the same chair at the same laptop in the same home um, with every meeting from that same spot, it's it's harder, I think, to retain the nuances of of the experiences that we're having. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. And I think the the absorption of the full, I think it's about sensory context in that, in that sense. So if you're yes. with someone at lunch, yeah. it's a very different sensory context than you know, your living room or your office or what have you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there are certain specific things, for instance, if, if I'm thinking about things like email, I've noticed that now I take a little bit longer to try and use sensation-based words in there. Like instead huh. of saying thanks, I'll say warmly just because I want to extend the sense of felt presence, even though it's just a verbal signifier and not actually the thing itself. Are there, are there certain maybe even little tactics that we can employ to help people feel more safe and connected, even just through email or video conferencing? The technology we've already established, it's not as rich. It's not, it doesn't feel like the same kind of connection. Um, and, you know, it has some compensatory features. You can do things with the emoticons. You can do things with the, with polls. You can do things with um, the yes, no buttons. Um, I think it's worth trying, even though they're somewhat artificial mm -hmm. or clunky, they are a participation forcer. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that can just, you know, if, I, if I'm being asked to respond to a poll as silly or simple as that is, I have to do, I have to do something, right? I have to, I have to stay engaged. I have to, um, and my, my opinion is being asked for uh, in a way. And and so, you know, I, I think of these features that some of the technologies have as um, scaffolding to help us connect and engage in a different way, because we're not connecting and engaging in the usual way. Mm. I also wonder what you think about the fact that video platforms, you know, if you're thinking about Microsoft Teams or Zoom and you can see people in gallery view, which is quite an odd thing when you mm -hmm. think about it. Right. Um, and some people have raised this idea of the fact that it might actually reduce the hierarchy that, you know, we might ordinarily find in the physical boardroom. So there's not one person at the head of the table, mm -hmm. even though obviously in video platforms we have to take turns to speak. But given that hierarchy when it's handled poorly, can elicit fear. And in your book, you've talked about how it can reduce psychological safety, which then inhibits learning and creativity. Mm -hmm. What should facilitators or leaders be mindful of when they're trying to facilitate online collaboration in that form? Well, I think it's a good hypothesis. It's that we're all in the gallery view. We're all, we all have an equal little square. If you watch in speaker view where we're, we've got the gallery, but then whoever's speaking pops up big, you could say that's even more flattening because then whoever is whoever is speaking is suddenly, you know, large and important, and then others are small and in the background, and then it, and it keeps shifting, which is a nice sort of distributed leadership image if you think about it. But I I don't think we really know enough uh, to say 
that the hierarchy is flattened? I, I think it's a really interesting question, you know, and, and it would be fun to study it, right? To, to sort of see whether people feel, um, less intimidated by power differences because of that visual experience or whether, um, in fact, the trappings are still there. I mean, who's calling the meeting, um, you know, or, or whether there's differences, you know, depending on a, a set of factors we'd have to think about more. Yeah, I mean, it just raises so many questions, I think, especially because before it was just something that was nice to have. And now, of course, this form of communication has become vital for so many of us. Um, another connected theme that I, I'd love to get your thoughts on is around the the ways in which we bridge differences, especially if we start to see people working remotely, you know, the, the differences in terms of geographic location are going to lessen. Mm. So when it comes to perhaps collaborating across borders, have you got thoughts about how cultural differences, you mentioned before, um, power distance, how things like power distance or one's level of individuality or collectivism might potentially come into play when creating psychological safety in a diverse team? Yes. You know, I, I recently, um, I'm part of a, a, a large study. I mean, it's in a, it's in a large company. Um, we've got a pretty large data set from employees all over the world. And, um, of course these, these data can be misleading because there are confounds, the more diverse teams, you know, the teams with multiple nationalities represented tend to be higher level teams. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know those are the kinds of teams that you sort of need an engineer from over here and a marketer mm -hmm. from over there and 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 the teams that are more homogenous tend to be kind of frontline teams operational teams um so with that in mind the data would suggest that these more nationally diverse teams have higher psychological safety than the than the functionally homogenous teams but i think it's that result is explained by organizational status mm -hmm. um as well and we don't yet know we don't whether, I mean, the, what's more interesting is to look at the differences across these multinational teams and see which ones have managed to transcend their differences and which ones haven't, and then ask why. Um, mm. And, and, and I think that's, that's kind of future work. But if I had to, um, you know, if I had to guess, I would say the multinational teams that do well are the ones that that make it discussable, that approach each other's, and this this has been demonstrated in cross-functional work, but that when we approach each other across the boundary, whether it's our nation or our, our function, our expertise, um, with curiosity, um, you know, just a genuine sense that the person on the other side of this boundary is a treasure, right, is a person who brings something I don't have. So, even selfishly, I want to know more about it, right? And and when when you can put in place that cross boundary curiosity, I, I I can describe this as a an orientation toward collaboration, but really an orientation toward collaborating to solve problems, mm. right? It's not just it wouldn't it be nice to know about Malaysia, right? It's it's um, what what's the kind of compelling goal that we're trying to accomplish and what do you bring, right? And, and by the way, what are you up against? And what are you trying to do? And and what you know, what what does your boss over there need? And what does mine need? And and so making our differences um, discussable, I believe, starts with just a curiosity, a reminder that we should be interested in each other. Mm. I love that. It sounds like such a simple thing, but actually, it's such a powerful quality to cultivate. It is, and it's cultivatable, and it's not naturally occurring necessarily i mean it could be right it could be naturally occurring for some people but maybe it's i think it has relationships with with the uh, growth mindset and and just that um perpetual recognition that i always have i have more to learn and i think the sense of growth is something that people seem to be again speaking a bit more about and there's a desire i guess after retreating and locking down and hunkering down this desire to move outwards again and I think mm. certainly the research I've come across there's there seems to be more of an appetite and a desire for finding purpose and meaning and connection at work and I wonder how you think if you think of the future of business we can we can start to create or can we start to create a sense of purpose and meaning and connection at work 
Is that something that you think businesses and leaders are able to offer? I think we have to. Honestly, in, in knowledge-intensive work, and that's just about everything, uh, if people do not have a sense of purpose and meaning, they simply will go through the motions. And that may be good enough, but you don't want good enough, right? You want, you want great. You want, you want people to really use their brains, really use their heart and soul to work with each other to contribute to something that matters. So if you don't have a compelling value proposition to offer your employees along the lines of, if you work here, you get to contribute to something that matters. I think uh, you're really losing a, a serious opportunity um, for better performance and for, you know, for better engagement and all of the things that come with that. So if I asked you another big question for you, <laughs> if I asked you to envision what in your mind would look like a thriving, resilient organization, if we're looking to the future, what might you imagine? Well, when I think of a, when I try to think of a thriving, resilient organization, to me, it looks like one with psychological safety, right? So that people are able to detect issues and come up with ideas and just um, not hold back, right? That there isn't a sense of some portion of your mental energy is tied up in staying safe uh, because there's a climate of psychological safety. It looks like teaming. It has a robust capacity to collaborate. People just kind of routinely reach out within and across boundaries um, to get stuff done. And a strong shared mission, right? A strong belief that what we're doing matters and that we can contribute to it by working together. And I think finally, that organization has the capacity for frequent reflection, right? In the midst of action, just the ability to um, be constantly saying, how are we doing and what could we be doing uh, differently? It's, it's, it's uh, learning in action. And then, I mean, you get asked a lot of questions about your work because it's such a fascinating topic and it touches everybody. I mean, we've looked at it through mm. the lens of the business side of things, but obviously psychological safety within other forms of groups is equally important. So among the questions that I imagine you get asked a lot, is there a question that you wish people would ask you that they don't? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, you know, it's a good question. And um, occasionally in the in the past, I've come up with with one um, but not, I, I really, I guess I get asked such a variety of questions really, because the, as you say, the, this idea bleeds into so many different areas. I mean, certainly to me, first and foremost, it's the workplace, but it, um, it affects workplaces as diverse as, you know, front lines of patient care mm -hmm. to aviation, to product development and, and on and on it goes. So, um, so I get asked a, a lot of different questions. Okay, so you, you get asked enough of a variety that there's not one burning one that you just think, oh. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. And the one I am waiting for someone to ask is, would it be okay if I wrote your next book for you? Yes, I think we're all waiting for that one. <laughs> <laughs> You've written a fair few, and it is it is really quite intensive work. It is. It's more work than, than it looks, isn't it? It definitely is. And to make something really coherent and mm. enjoyable and readable is that balance is it's a daunting and complex task. So I realize we're coming close to time and I have two last little questions I'd like to put to you. Great. The first of them um, is, and I, we've kind of touched on this from the business side, but I'd like to open this up a little more. What kind of world do you want to build? A compassionate one. Hmm. I mean, it's too short, I guess, but it's um, it breaks my heart that so many people's work lives are terrible. You know, not just not fulfilling, but full of fear and anxiety, whether that's about losing their job or being themselves or a variety of other things that people are um, afraid of. And it's um it seems uh, unfortunately to be uh, on the rise and and i i i think the kinds of inequality we see in our society exacerbate it 
Um, so perhaps what goes along with compassionate world is a more equitable world, of course. And then what one thing, what one step or practice might you suggest we engage in to help us move in that direction? I think it's a, a little practice called stop, challenge, choose, where stop is just the, the self-discipline to pause. You know, our brains are very fast. They, they, they see something, they conclude something. Um, when we can interrupt that automatic process and pause to say, huh, maybe it's something different. Right? Maybe that person didn't intend mm. to be rude. Um, maybe they've had a bad day, right? So challenge that initial automatic interpretation and then choose an interpretation that's healthier for you and for others. Thank you for listening to The Hive Podcast with me, Natalie the Hive. To find out more about today's guest and the themes we explored, please visit the show notes page at natalienahai.com forward slash The Hive Podcast. If you've enjoyed the series, please do share it with your friends and give it a rating or review. And for more insights and insider tips, you can join my newsletter as well. My thanks to Caro C for producing. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to sharing more with you in the next episode.